Um, so welcome back. And this is a panel uh, which is called Imaging Extraction. Very different uh, from the panel that we've just heard. Uh, it's more kind of historical, art historical, and then also we're going to hear quite a lot about uh, particular practice-based projects um, as well. So I'm going to first introduce two of the uh, speakers um, who come up and give their talks, and then after that, introduce the other two speakers. There's a little bit of a difference. The first two are more historical, and then um, the next two talks um, will be more practice-oriented um, as well. So, so uh, first up, we have Toba Auckland Peck, who is a PhD candidate in art history at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Um, her research on British 19th and 20th century art investigates themes of environmental change and pollution, the industrial provenance of artistic materials, and the integration of working class perspectives in the visual arts. She's published quite a lot already on related topics um, in Grey Room and Courtauld books. Um, the title of her talk is See Britain First on Shell, Modernism, Imperialism, and the British Petroleum Industry. And then after that, we'll have Nancy Demerdash, who is an assistant professor of art history in the Department of Art and Art History and the associate director of the Prentice M. Brown Honors Program at Albion College in Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh, not in Pennsylvania. She received her, I should stick to the script. Um, <laughs> So she received a Master of Science in Architecture Studies at MIT and a PhD from the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton. I was very lucky to cross paths with her there. She's published widely and is currently working on her book manuscript, The Architectural Politics of Tunisian Modernity, Reconstruction, Decolonization, and Development. So the title of Nancy's talk is Fueling Foment, Counter-Colonial Histories of Phosphate Extraction in Tunisia. And as you'll see, phosphate and fertilizers is also kind of a running th theme through this panel, and we'll come back to that in the Q&A. So over to Toba. Thank you so much, Stria, and also to Autograph and the PMC for all of your, your work to put together this wonderful conference. I'm really thrilled to be here. Today, my paper, See Britain First on Shell, Modernism, Imperialism, and the British Petroleum Industry, is going to give us a bit of a longer history of extraction, exploitation, and art patronage, and I'm really looking forward to discussing it with all of you afterwards. British artist Peter Snow's 1954 painting, Oiopolis, is a dizzying grid of intricate structures that, though they recall the solid monumentality of skyscrapers, are porous. The painting plays with abstraction, creating legible spatial recession, but then immediately dissolving the tangibility of the structures. Yet in this non-figurative image, Snow included a small contextual symbol, a scallop shell perched jauntily on the center left. The scallop shell, which we can assume was rendered in bright yellow, would spur recognition of the familiar design in the mid-century viewer, just as it would today. It is the logo of Shell Oil. With this knowledge, we see the scene differently. Instead of an abstract investigation of line, light, and depth, Snow based this image on a real-world scene, the array of pipes around an oil refinery. His composition uses the pattern of the pipes to fill the entire canvas, denuding the scene of industrial detail in order to increase its mystery and monumentality. Despite the abstraction of the painting, its method remains intimately tied to extractive infrastructure. Snow was one of 35 young British artists commissioned by Shell to make artwork based on petroleum infrastructure in the United Kingdom for a 1955 exhibition titled The Artist's View of an Industry. It was first shown in London and then traveled under the auspices of the Arts Council and later Shell to cities in the UK and abroad, including Leeds, Zurich, Cape Town, Brussels, and Tokyo. I argue that this exhibition was an early and consequential expression of the mutual influence of art and petroleum. Its goals and structures, as well as the controversies it invited, anticipated debates around patronage, representation, and environmental impact that still inform our consideration of art's potential to challenge or enable extractive industry. Concern about the patronage of the arts by Shell and BP continue into the present day, 
evidenced by the activism of groups like Liberate Tate and Just Stop Oil. If today this is a conversation about less visible and more insidious frameworks of capital, in the 1950s, these themes were made explicit through images of oil infrastructure itself. There was a perception in this period of the mutual power of petroleum and artistic representations specifically of industry. And Shell's commission proposed a model of visual engagement that normalized oil's refinement and use in the cultural consciousness. Ultimately, I contend that the affinity between abstraction and the unfamiliar geometric expanse of refinery infrastructure, such as the one demonstrated in Oiopolis, suggests an alignment of modern art and the modernity of petroleum power. The artist's view of an industry asserts the power of fossil industry to shape the language of modernity, a dynamic that Ross Barnett and Daniel Warden define as an attribute of oil culture. While the inclusion of diverse styles was an intimation of visual freedom, the promotion of abstract works offered a formal apparatus that obscured the human and environmental impact of petroleum production. Oil's liquidity sets it apart from other energy sources because the substance could be transported through a sprawling network of containers. Pipelines forestalled access to oil and were designed, therefore, to prevent human disruption and avoid human labor. Likewise, cultural projects such as this generated consumable commodities that concealed the messy origins of industry. In this, artworks functioned as containers that controlled the experience and dissemination of petroleum. Shell was founded in London in 1833. And beginning in the 1920s, they commissioned prominent artists to create posters for a well-known advertising campaign in Britain. The slogans included See Britain First on Shell, the text set against painted backgrounds of fields, churches, and castles. Crucially, Shell suggested that this was an environmentally responsible mode of advertising because by affixing the posters only to the sides of trucks that delivered Shell oil, the company left the rural landscape unsullied by unsightly billboards. The image campaign merged bucolic nostalgia with the syntax of modernism, but the images prevented a fictional British countryside unaltered by the ravages of modernity. The visual lexicon Shell constructed around motorized exploration was predicated on their exploitation of a vast system of foreign oil fields. Oil extraction necessitated a significant disruption of the landscape, as is well known and illustrated here in images that actually come from a history of Royal Dutch Shell. The advertisement series focus on the domestic rural landscape minimize this reality and visual and physical violence of industry missing from the view of the British countryside proposed by the Shell advertisements was removed likewise to foreign soil. While during the heyday of the Shell poster campaign in the 1920s and 30s, excuse me, I'll just go back one, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, the majority of Britain's petroleum was sourced from sites like Sumatra and Baku, World War II posed a significant challenge to Britain's energy reserves. Britain began to look more seriously at the potential of its domestic oil drilling capabilities, and oil wells were sunk in so-called scenic sites like Sherwood Forest and the Jurassic Coast, which is the subject of uh, this image by Paul Nash on the bottom right. This trend continued in the post-war period. Shell had, by this point, also shifted its representational approach to normalize industrial infrastructure in the domestic sphere. When the artist's view of an industry opened in London in 1955, the organizers emphasized that it was not an advertising venture. The exhibition space was a gallery rather than a delivery truck. The works were framed paintings rather than paper posters. Shell's commission was, the catalog emphasized, without constraint, requiring only, quote, the oil industry as subject. The commissioned artists were invited to visit any of the sites of Shell's British operations. They were not asked to do a job of advertising, journalist Ian Hamilton wrote in the introduction. Their artistic conscience was in no danger from the outside at any rate. Indeed, the varied subjects recorded in the catalog seem to attest to artistic freedom. Hop gardens in Shell's agricultural center, two workers crouched over an air compressor, and an oil tanker ship. Yet, the images are strikingly repetitive. The scenes of the refineries, distillation units, chimneys, pipes, and gas storage tanks are mostly unpeopled. 
The artist concentrated instead on the dramatic shifts and turns of the pipes, the bulbous tanks, and the alien refinery landscapes. The paintings that you see here, which I'll note are in black and white because, and I'd be happy to talk about this later, uh, they are at the moment not extant or accessible to me. Um, the paintings seem to recombine the same industrial containers rather than the material of petroleum itself into different patterns. The exhibition leaves the impression, the Times noted, that pipes in every possible convolution were the set subject. Even human figures rarely appear in the wilderness of metal forms. To take the oil industry as subject was to assert that the subject of petroleum could also be confined to its containers. What then of the five fully abstract paintings that were included in the exhibition? These were listed in the catalog without location, emphasizing that they were creative reactions to the refining process rather than depictions of a particular place. Stephen Knapp, Bernard Cohen, and Peter Snow had practices based in abstraction, and their contributions to the exhibition depicted the theoretical aspects of the oil industry, force, liquidity, and growth, rather than details of its process. These works represented the vastness, frenzied movement, and constant metamorphosis of the landscapes, products, and infrastructure of the oil business, a monumental industrial drama that resisted the confinement of a realist image. The rejection of legible detail suggests that linear narratives about oil might be fundamentally incompatible with the realities of petromodernity. It was the expansiveness of abstract artworks like Oilopolis and Liquid Constellation, which you can see here, that depicted oil's futuristic power by manipulating and expanding the visual syntax of the refinery, the twisted pipes, machines, and buildings. In these paintings, such elements functioned independently of the human worker. The absence of the worker bothered Marxist critic John Berger, who wrote a scathing criticism of the exhibition. What is so significant, he wrote, is the desolately mechanical and inhuman aspect of the show. It is true that many oil installations are highly mechanized, but there is a lack of any attempt to imagine how the plant might strike those who man it. The non-figurative paintings confirmed Shell's vision of a fully industrial world created through a series of mechanical procedures that functioned outside the bounds of natural processes or human labor. The more incomprehensible the scene, the less it related to the environmental problems of oil extraction, labor conflicts, refineries rising over the Thames, drilling apparatuses, and foreign oil fields. The culpability of the artist in the modern corporation also incensed members of the radical artist group, the Lateriste Internationale, when the exhibition traveled to Brussels in 1956. They sought freedom from the commodity, an idea obviously at odds with the aims of the Shell exhibit. Led by Guy Debord, they drafted a protest pamphlet entitled Toutes les dames au salon, roughly translated to all the whores of the salon. This exhibition sets a precedent, they wrote. It renders the artist's last feelings of revolt anemic, opening the door to all compromise. Already, one can see a painting of the so-called non-figurative type, which is perfectly abstract, with the exception of a single word, shell, clearly legible, precise, repugnant as a canker. The artist's view of an industry, the Lettres Internationale saw, gave the illusion of stylistic freedom, but ultimately constrained the artist even more through the central tenet of the show, that integration into the industrial system was necessary for the modern art object. Shell's Oiopolis, for example, creatively interprets the oil field without interrogating the terms of its engagement. Though Hamilton claimed that the show did not compromise artistic integrity from the outside, the Lettres Internationale protest implied it was even worse, and compromised artistic integrity from the inside. It is not that the Shell logo in Snow's Oiopolis that gestures to an acceptance of extractive capitalism, but the abstracted modern world completely created out of and predicated on the industrial framework of petroleum. In closing, I turn to an article published in Shell magazine in 1958 titled Black Art about a visit that Shell paid to a contemporary art exhibition of the Bitumen works of abstract painter William Green. An interesting and slightly startling new use for Bitumen was recently on display, it reads. It is oil painting, loosely speaking, Shell said in justification of the trip. 
William Green made large abstract paintings with a mixture of bitumen, paraffin, gravel, and sand. Inspired by the works of American abstract expressionists, and excuse me while I hope that this video works. And ooh, just to give you a sense here of his work. Oh. For works of art and, of a different kind, sorry. The world of painting, who doesn't recognize? Videos are always a dangerous thing. Okay, I'm just trying to mute it. Okay, sorry. I'm just going to leave it since I can't mute it. My apologies. Um, <laughs> and so you can see one of his paintings. Um, excuse me. Um, inspired by the work of abstract uh, expressionist, Green put his canvas on the floor and poured viscous oil on top of it. For some pieces, which I was trying to show in the video, he ran a bicycle over the wet black surface. Green's method became famous through this film, which is called Action Painter, that showed the artist at work. The news piece lampooned the artist, setting a video of his process against a catchy jazz track. He would sometimes, the commentator concluded, set the mixture of bitumen and paraffin on fire to, quote, heighten the effect. Bitumen paint is a fossil substance derived from naturally occurring asphalt, which was replaced in the 19th century by synthetic versions derived from the refinement of coal, paraffin, and petroleum. Green was interested in the instability of these modern substances, and he warped the thick bitumen through fire. His paintings made the destructive quality of the industrial substance clear, a departure from cultural works like those in the artist's view of an industry that sought to domesticate petroleum by containing it. The appearance of Green's art in the pages of Shell magazine draws a final decisive contrast between art related to oil industry and art actually derived from petromaterials. Unlike Snow's Oiopolis, Green's bitumen works had no resonance with the subject matter of the oil industry. In the burnt, unstable surface, the viewer could discern the messy process of refinement that was hidden from these other visual representations of oil. Without the obfuscating spectacle of oil culture, which was created through corporations, pipes, cars, and tankers, we're left with what Shell Magazine called the rough and mysterious excrescences that betray the crude origins of refined fossil material. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers, Sriya, Mark, and Mindy, for generously inviting me here today. Uh, my talk is entitled Fueling Foment, Fueling Resistance, Countercolonial Histories of Phosphate Extraction in Tunisia. And it is an exploration of two Tunisian photographers, Mona Karai and Ziad bin uh, Romdan and their artistic activism in highlighting the physical, societal, and environmental repercussions of the extractive phosphate industries in contemporary southwestern Tunisia. This paper historicizes the colonial roots of this phosphate industry, analyzes its infrastructures, and examines the connections between those industries' popular resistance movements and the protest inherent to Karai and Ben Romdan's works. Extractivism generates and propels the need for sustained profitability, and as a means for the accumulation of surplus capital and raw materials, extractivism is inseparable from the colonial and imperial economic enterprise. In 1881, Tunisia became a French protectorate, and since the discovery of phosphates in Tunisia by prospectors in 1884, happening on the heels of the uh, so-called War of the Pacific or Nitrate War of 1879 to 1883 uh, in Chile. Uh, one can see from this 1914 extractivist manual on Tunisian minerals how quickly colonists and technocrats were to capitalize on the protectorate's resources. The map clearly illustrates the density of zinc, lead, and iron mines in the northern terrain, whereas phosphate mines clustered in the south and southwest in the towns of al Radayef, Matlawi, and Gafsa. Railway lines permeate to the major ports of Bezert, Tunis, Sousse, and Sifax. 
a table from the same manual demonstrates the annual tonnage of each mineral exported and its corresponding value in francs stretching back to 1892 when the first major zinc extractions were recorded. French colonial settlers were deeply uh, invested in the economic success of the phosphate mines and sensitive to any potential threats to that success. Daily newspapers like Le Depeche Tunisienne or more industry-specific periodicals such as this one pictured here kept officials abreast of trade developments, mining agreements, and impediments to extractivist goals. With the lands confiscated and expropriated from indigenous, largely pastoral nomadic clans of the Southwest and handed over to settlers, the dispossessed, the dispossessed population had little alternative but to set and rise themselves and sell their own labor to, uh, to the colonists. This created a sharp rural-urban divide between the southwestern governorates and the more urbane, affluent coastal cities in Tunisia and is indicative of what sociologist Benoit Chalin has dubbed, quote, the uneven distribution of violence, historical processes that connect the colonial past to current practices of military repression and symbolic violence, end quote. Capitalist extraction went hand in hand with the uneven political development and the physical and symbolic violence of center periphery models of governance and marginalization ensued. When France Fanon famously noted that, quote, frontiers are shown by barracks and police stations, end quote, it should come as no surprise that such disciplinary headquarters were strategically located next to sites of surplus extraction and private investment, specifically phosphate mines and agricultural farms. Under the protectorate, the Bey, uh, the Ottoman Bey, who was the vassal to the report, reporting to the Ottoman Sultan, paid for the security-related expenses that repressed any mobilization uh, that threatened the output and economic interest of the phosphate mines um, and, and considered part of um, la Tunisie utile, or useful Tunisia. The implied remainder of the country, this quote-unquote unuseful Tunisia, uh, in the rural uh, southern and southwestern parts, were organized by Falaga, uh, those who were resistance or guerrilla fighters uh, directly challenging French colonial authorities. But it should be noted that it was, in, it was precisely in these borderlands between the so-called useful uh, minefield regions and the uncultivable areas of southwestern Tunisia where the second oldest labor union in Africa formed in 1924, the Confédération Générale des Travailleurs Tunisiennes. Um, so yes, keep that in the back of your mind. Machinery and technological innovations hastened the extractivist accumulation of phosphates, and nearly all phosphate deposits were shipped back to France from the port of Sifax for inventorying and processing, though some shipments were exported directly to Italy and Britain. After the country achieved political independence in 1956, President Habib Bourguiba was adamant to keep the country on a path towards modernization and development, leaning into the West at the height of the Cold War even if it more or less maintained colonial era extractive practices and a geopolitical imbalance of power that would cumulatively over the years wound Tunisia's political economy. Endless studies in the 1960s strategized about upping extraction and production to boost the national economy. But a prime issue is that the racialization of the southwestern govern governorates and the aforementioned uneven distribution of violence persisted. Countless articles in the scholarly literature from social scientists and historians recount the huge disparities of wealth, opportunity, services, amenities between the coastal cities and the hinterland. As the renowned historian of the Maghreb, Julia Clancy Smith notes, quote, Autocratic regimes, whether colonial or post-colonial, almost always neglect rural peoples and the subsistent agrarian sectors. sectors excuse me, end quote. And so between December of 1983 and January of 1984, major demonstrations took place in Gafsa, 
at the heart of the phosphate mines, later spreading across the country in an event that has come to be known as the bread riots. When the government rescinded food subsidies on cereals and basic foodstuffs. This happened due to austerity measures imposed by the IMF and World Bank in exchange for loans, and bread, rices, bread prices subsequently skyrocketed. After some weeks of national chaos, Bourguiba reinstated the subsidies, but the point is that the people of the Southwest were the first to rise up. Sidi Bouzid, Another city in the country's interior marks the site of another revolutionary turn, where in December 2010, the disaffected young fruit and vegetable stall vendor, Mohammed Bouazizi, self-immolated in an act of political protest and defiance. When uh, President uh, Zine um, Al-Abdin Bin Ali shown, showed up at the clinic for burn victims where Bouazizi was being treated a few days before he died, the politically tone-deaf facade only fueled a tidal wave of fury from Tunisians, outraged at their authoritarian dictator's staged sympathy and aloof dis disconnectedness from people's daily struggles. The legacies of these resistance movements are not lost on contemporary Tunisian artists. A native to Sifax, Mona Karai's series, Murmurer, is a play on the French word mur, or wall, and the English verb to murmur. Seemingly desolate in a partial state of ruin, neglect, or abandonment, the walls of phosphate or industrial facilities appeared dilapidated. Metallic fences have been trespassed, yet the barbed wire remains intact. Gates and enclosures, presumably guarding reserves of raw material wealth, are surrounded by utter emptiness. In their somber state of disintegration, one wonders whether these infrastructures and their crumbling fortress of walls are sites of invasion, a war zone, or borders. Ziad ben Romdan's works, by contrast, aesthetically capture the violence and enormity of phosphate extraction in Metlaoui and other regional towns. The tracks of the machinery leave rippled scars in the earth, while discarded chunky rocks from the mines seem to spill out into a residential district to be used later in construction. An interplay of textures, surfaces, and shadows creating zigzagging industrial quilts of phosphate machinery here as a jerry-rigged, circuitous hose taps into a cracked government building, perhaps providing an oblique, if unveiled, commentary on the lack of state maintenance of public infrastructure. His photographic sitters, whether ex-miners, former freedom fighters, or Falaga, or adrift youth, instantiate their humanity, dignity and life in, t in spite of the toxic industrial specter on the horizon. Established in 1972 on the northern side of the coastal town of Gabis, the Tunisian chemical group has since been a leading industrial complex involved in the extraction and processing of phosphate. Today, exported phosphates constitute 4% of Tunisia's GDP and 15% of all exports, with Bangladesh as its top importer. Yet the Gulf of Gabas on which it sits is one of the most toxic coastlines in the Mediterranean, dubbed in Arabic Ashat al Maut, or the coast of death. Plumes of smoke cloud the air, blackish waters of literally radioactive phosphogypsum crash on the, sh on the shores, periodically washing up dead fish uh, and yellow dust piles in the vicinity of, of factories nearby. Taken together, Karai and Ben Romdan's photographic practice gestures at the neo-colonial afterlives of colonial era extractive in, uh, industrial infrastructures, caught between unemployment, poverty, and death. So this headline sort of um, alludes, this mining region is far from dead. Inasmuch as these photographers' work is a poetic meditation on the phosphate industry's grave environmental injustices, it is also a subtle documentarian protest of global geopolitical power differentials and against the governmental neglect of rurally based Tunisians and a critique of the dystopian extractivist world we continue to inhabit. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Toba and Nancy. Um, I just want to introduce the next two speakers, or oh, three actually, because um, up next uh, is a duo um, called Fraud, um, Audrey Sampson and Francisco Gallardo. Uh, artist duo whose work has been exhibited internationally. With their spatial practice, they develop forms of art-led inquiry that examine financialization through extractive practices and cultivate ways in which we might encourage relations of solidarity that promote the inseparability of land, water, and bodies. Audrey is a professor in more than computational arts, it's a great title, um, at L'Ecole de Recherche Graphique, uh, and uh, Francisco is an architect uh, and studio tutor at uh, Loughborough University and Central St. Martins. The duo's work is part of the permanent collections of the European Investment Bank Institute and the Art and Nature Center uh, and the Berlas Foundation in Spain. That the title of their um, talk today is Ungrounding the Critical Mineral. Um, straight up after that is Crystal Benz, uh, who's an artist and writer who critically and poetically examines knowledge systems and power structures using a method that often begins with feminist reinterpretations of archival histories or myths. Her way of working makes essential, often surprising connections between science, history, capitalism, colonialism, gender, and political power. Her publications and artworks and installations range from jacquard textiles woven with computer punch card programs to photo books connecting early computing, nuclear colonialism, and women computer programmers. Um, the title of her talk is Phosphate Mines and Resistance Gardens in Western Sahara. So we're looking forward to all of these kind of histories and very local and specific things coming together so we can have a discussion about all of it afterwards. So uh, Audrey and Francisco. So thank you for the organizers. Uh, thank you, Surya, for the invitation. Uh, in this very short presentation, we're going to introduce the framework of our practice and looking into more specifically through the lens of what we call phosphor praxis, given that phosphate is a kind of a, a common theme that runs through this group. So our practice poses questions that aim to decenter uh, dominant systems and frameworks that produce systems of validation but also the perpetuation of extraction, a common theme today. So for example, in our case, uh, regimes of financialization and its role in resource making, which produces fish as resource or that can be extracted and traded. Uh, what am I missing here? Sorry. Getting old. <laughs> I also wanted to add, uh, which is a recurrent theme in our research, is that one of the instrumental parts of this regime of extraction that we'd like to talk about a bit is a, bit, a list of so-called uh, critical raw minerals uh, and what is now known in the UK as the critical mineral strategy. So here we can, you can see the materials list represented as a graph which essentially propels a strategy to ensure the interrupted access to resources uh, to these materials that you see. However, while ensuring that the EU and the UK subsistence through this flow of resources is prompting a series of treaties and agreements which are leading to exhaustion, pollution within the global majority. So we are interested in the ways that the management of critical mineral supply sustains extractivism. So for us, and the grounding imagines a physical encounter with dirt, rock, of any of such materials, a textual apprehension which cannot be encompassed by the graphs and initiatives which govern bodies like in the UK and the EU used to describe minerals, materiality for this matter. So this slide also collates a genealogy of extractive imaginaries, um, such as Eurafrica, which was uh, the very real notion that uh, the European economic community was predicated upon the explicit extraction of African resources, but also, we don't have time to speak about them all, uh, but the Californian analogy, which um, had so-called civilizing forces were imagined through irrigation techniques transplanted from California to Morocco. So we're showing these because on the one hand our practice seems or seeks to stay with the trouble of these genealogies, but because also they shape so much of our current and future conditions. 
And also because the graph you see here showing all the minerals completely decontextualized from their social or environmental or cultural relations has prompted us to go about recontextualizing them, if you will. So we'd argue that historicization here is necessary to rethink and intervene in narratives that celebrate the managerial efficiency sublime, as we like to think about it, or perhaps the management as a so-called game-changing state-of-the-art technology. So this is what we could call an expanded version of the initial graph uh, that we created as an online platform. It's what it might look like if you would open the whole thing, and it's an attempt uh, to actually justly recontextualize uh, these minerals. I should also add, or, no, it's okay. So Fawcett is one such a mineral that appears in that list. Actually, it appears twice. Um, but before we uh, speak about that thread, we want to share um, how um, one, one previous example of the work. In this case, we use silica sand, or hable, which is the cultural name for sand, which is illicitly mined in Western Sahara to engineer the world's largest uh, beaches, artificial beaches, which are not in Dubai, but rather in the Western Canary Islands. So um, by sourcing some of this uh, sand and making glass with it, we want to tap into some of the political and social entanglements that sand has with uh, tourism development and fascist archaeology in Spain. Oops. Um, in this case, a commission by the Istanbul Biennial, where we investigated fisheries or fish, fish stock as a resource through a genealogy of Spanish uh, fi um, fisheries development during Francisco Franco's dictatorship, a legacy that continues to this day until the EU and the partnerships that the EU negotiates today. So to return to phosphate, if the presentation will allow us. Um, so for us, phosphate holds um, the chemical, the political, and also the financial together. It's judged critical, um, mostly because it is a key ingredient in fertilizer, therefore it is critical to the operation of agro-business and also, of course, then food security, which I'm sure uh, we will come back to. Um, and so it's also, of course, one of the main causes of depleted soil health as well as poor river health in England, but also in many other places in the world. And as industrial fertilizer depletes soil, it requires further and higher concentrations of it to sustain productivity, thereby creating a, f a feedback loop sorry, of consistently increasing demands and increasing markets. And so as such, phosphate is the perfect capitalist commodity. Meanwhile, phosphate mining is also a crucial dimension of phosphate. Here we see uh, another sacred tree, sadly gone, which is a centuries-old acacia tree that was used for desert navigation, for trading caravans. On this very same spot, uh, lies today the Bukra mine, which holds the, the high, highest concentration of phosphate in the world, which we would like to expand upon a little bit further. And we want to, we want to linger here a, li a little bit further because um, the race of these genealogies constitute or what Jolan Dijkstra Cabré calls a form of histori historiographical invisibility. So for us, the emphasis here, and I think in the next contribution we'll also expand upon here, is that the dependency to this mineral is tightly embroiled with the impossibility of self-determination for the Sahrawi people, who have lived largely displaced in exile in campus along the Nigerian border since 1975. And also embroiled with the miners of Gafsa and so forth and so forth. Um, so with this in mind, how can we think of our bodies as inextricable to phosphate's cycle of displacement and recirculation? 
thinking uh, with the ways in which we might encourage relations of solidarity that promotes the inseparability of land and body or the inseparability of land phosphate and body perhaps in this context also considering that 70% of the world's phosphate rock reserves are in Morocco and Western Sahara, and that this is, of course, a key ingredient in fertilizer. We see here that bodies, both human and more than human, become inextricable not only with the mining practices that we've been discussing also through Nancy's talk, but also with financialization and commodity trading. So as, as a means to think with this inseparability, we began to investigate the triple superfaucet fertilizer as a, as a material of inquiry, what chemists call fluoroapatite. Uh, the, um, the pigment that you see here uh, is a pigment that um, uh, obtained from a, from a fertilizer that we sourced from a UK-based company which disclosed to us the use of Western Sahara phosphate, despite the fact that this constitutes a violation of international law according to the United Nations Legal Council. And in considering the historiographical invisibility of extractive practice, uh, which is critical central for the industrial fertilizer, in combination with the pigment, we are creating an archive, a physical repository of actual archival documentation of the mines of Bukra, such as the early infrastructural housing work uh, efforts that were behind the creating of the mine. The relevance of this archive lies in Spain's recent change of position regarding the colonization of its former colony, relinquishing all the responsibility to Morocco. So these archival materials that you see here are physical and are starting to resurface in an official offline and online markets, which seems to point to an intentional erasure. So in parallel to the pigment um, and the archive, we've also been thinking about how to engage with these complexities. Um, so as an example, we organized a public walk through Nottinghamshire, tracing a genealogy of fertilizer in the built environment, as well as uh, collectively discussing possible modes of resilience in agricultural, agriculture pardon, and the liveliness of soil. I would like to emphasize that this work has been made possible with the support of Art Angel, and now Stanley Picker Gallery, which enables us to devote time to open-ended investigative work with field trips, meeting farmers, and to, for to further develop collaborations within practitioners across the art, science, and the humanities. We also wanted to briefly mention that a crucial method in developing uh, most of our work is decollage, um, this idea of collective sense-making through decollage. And to thinking of this idea of, of, of epistemic commons, you know, this idea of common sense as something that is not state and not on stone, that can be open to reformulation, open to reinvention. So to finish, um, in this talk we wanted to very um, briefly think through the critical interdependence of materials and the circularity of materials, uh, also their trade and financialization, even though we didn't have time to go into so much of the details around that, uh, but also through elements of our practice. So for us, undergrounding the critical mineral exists on the one hand with an, an ontology of separation that represents minerals as being divorced from the social environmental conditions of extraction and production, but it is an effort also to consider the modern human existence of these minerals and so-called resources, such as fish, or what Max Liwaron will call their land relations. So undergrounding uh, for us is a very serious engagement with the management of resource extraction, what it mobilizes as well as the how in conversation with both the extractive, uh, quite violent extractive relations and also to, pose, to open up other possible uh, relations with land, water and bodies, both now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just so this isn't too disorienting, I should say this is a kind of um, lens-based research 
presentation of uh, certain aspects of this project, which is also sticking with the theme of phosphate and uh, uh, Western Sahara as well. So I'm going to begin at the end with the island. And this island is an island, but it's also industrial waste. It's an island of toxic refuse masquerading as a nature reserve. And rather than understanding waste as supplementary to capitalism, I read it following Nicole Shukin as something that's intrinsic to capitalism. Our so-called ecological ethic of material efficiency and waste recovery, as Shukin argues, rarely challenges capitalism, but often surreptitiously supports it. And so to understand the presence of this particular island, which is not a natural phenomenon, but constructed entirely of the heavy metal laden radioactive byproduct of phosphate fertilizer production, I had to track back to the beginning of the fertilizer supply chain, in other words, to the mine. And in coming to understand the mine, I came to understand that extractivism, as Imani Jacqueline Brown so memorably frames it, is best understood as a cosmology. But one thing at a time. As I said, this island, it's not the result, a uh, natural result of geological processes. It first appeared off the coast of southern Sweden in the 1980s. In the late 1970s, Swedish environmental legislation changed, meaning that fertilizer companies were no longer permitted to pump their radioactive carcinogenic waste directly into the sea, which is what they used to do. The new laws, however, had no prohibition against mounding the waste into an island in the sea. Yeah, uh, it's difficult to sense from the photographs, but the island has a complex topography. Its edges are low-lying, close to sea level, while areas near the center are 18 meters high. When it rains, water collects in the island's three containment pools to prevent discharge into the sea. In the island's early years, birds that stopped to drink from these pools died. The water so acidic, it burned their internal organs. And just as with nuclear waste, there are currently almost no processes in place to safely dispose of phosphate fertilizer waste. Across China's Yunnan and Sichuan provinces in Florida, among the largest phosphate refining areas in the world, Phosphogypsum is currently piled into these enormous mountains called stacks, gyp stacks, or corralled into containment ponds where it often leaches into the water table and drinking water networks. As far as I know, though, this is the only phosphogypsum island in the world. It's a place that perfectly exemplifies arguments Max Liberon has made of the relationships between colonial perceptions of nature as a source of perpetual resource extraction and a repository for the violence of past, present, and future industrial pollution. It hasn't rained in six years. Millions of years ago, water was plentiful. It rained and rained, and ancient water sedimented into phosphate deposits across what is now broad sweeps of desert. So from the island in Sweden, I moved to the deserts of Western Sahara. Deserts are often unthinkingly, or sometimes deliberately, described as empty, uninhabitable wastelands, a convenient fiction for commercial or political exploitation of those who have always lived in desert places. As Samia Heni reminds us, quote, despite the undeniable presence of human and non-human lives and forces in desert territories, the regime of emptiness has inhabited and is still inhabiting many desert imaginaries, end quote. Extractive fantasies of so-called empty deserts occupied the imaginations of Spanish colonial administrators when they ruled the area of North Africa, now known as Western Sahara, between 1884 and 1975. In the early 1960s, Sahari nomads guided Spanish geologists to an acacia tree that marked the location of an enormous vein of high-quality phosphate. Following this discovery, a major mining operation was undertaken. And in 1973, with technical assistance from German contractors, the Spanish colonial government constructed one of the seven wonders of extractive infrastructure, a 100-kilometer-long conveyor belt used to transport mined phosphate rock across the inner desert to the coastal port. Easterly winds blow the chalk-colored dust off the belt and onto the sand below, making the conveyor belt one of the rare instances of infrastructure visible from space. In 1966, 
as part of a long process towards decolonization, the United Nations declared that Spain should hold an independence referendum in accordance with the aspirations of the indigenous Sahrawi population of Western Sahara. This vote never took place. And in 1973, the Polisario Front formed in a militant movement towards Sahrawi self-determination. Two years later, when Spain had effectively lost control over the region, the Moroccan state enacted its own colonial takeover, bypassing the International Court of Justice's insistence that the Sahrawi people had a right to self-determination. Morocco disagreed and sent more than 300,000 soldiers and settlers across the border in what was later mythologized as the Green March. Today, Western Sahara is described by the UN as a non-decolonized territory. It's, it's largely administered by a Moroccan colonial regime of military occupation. Although many Saharis remain resident in Western Sahara, equally many were displaced to refugee camps in the Algerian desert, where they have been living since 1975. Despite the establishment of a UN mission for a referendum in Western Sahara in 1991, such a vote has never taken place. I can't say with certainty, but it's at least plausible that the phosphate which produced the phosphogypsum that made the island off the Swedish coast came from Morocco. As the world's second largest phosphate producer, Morocco actually has no need of Western Sahara's phosphate deposits, which are comparatively small, but it does not wish to have a self-governing neighbor as economic competition. Morocco continues to extract phosphate from Western Sahara, though it has become increasingly difficult to sell. Thanks to Sahari campaigners such as Tihbar Ahmed Saleh and nonprofit groups such as the Western Sahara Resource Watch, who argue that Morocco is violating international law through the exploitation of the territory's resources, many major importers and countries now refuse to accept shipments from the disputed territory. On the other hand, confronted with this ethical dilemma, there are still a handful of global companies who simply choose to look the other way. The Sahari men, women, and children who were displaced to Algeria in 1975 are not allowed to enter Western Sahara. A few months ago, I spoke to the Sahari filmmaker Mohamed Labat. We spoke of his current projects and my recent trip to his homeland. He's curious to know how I managed to enter Western Sahara. Why should I be able to enter his country and travel comparatively freely when he cannot? And it's Mohamed who points me toward Taleb Khahim, and the gardens of the refugee camps in Algeria. Culturally nomadic people, the Saharis have had to adapt to conditions of restricted territory and enforced scarcity. And living conditions in the Algerian desert are defined by, among other things, the distribution of international food aid and extremes of weather, it's drought, very little rain, and temperatures that exceed 50 degrees centigrade in the summer. In the early 2000s, prompted in part by a desire to cultivate healthy food out with the food aid structures, Taleb, an agricultural engineer, initiated the first gardens in the Samara refugee camp. Various meth models were tested, including low water use, hydroponic and sandoponic systems before they were extended across the other four refugee camps. Notably, importantly, no phosphorus fertilizer is used. Instead, soil is enriched using local nutrients, animal and green manures, and composted food waste. For the Sahrawi families who have been illegally dispossessed of their mineral resources, this refusal to use phosphate is a deeply political act. Today, a network of 1,000 gardens extends across the five refugee camps. Carrots, courgettes, lettuces, and herbs emerge almost unbelievably from below the sand. Families grow barley grass to feed fresh fodder to their goats and sow metacago between their vegetable crops to improve soil fertility and prevent erosion. For the families of the refugee camps, the gardens provide a way to produce healthy food and some independence from food-related aid structures. There are also sites of new knowledge production for horticultural practices in extreme climactic conditions. To a significant degree, the mined phosphate rock used around the world for agricultural fertilizers is the reason why so many Sahuari families were expelled from their land. The same phosphate has also reshaped, among other things, water, e water ecosystems around the world, polluting our seas, rivers, and lakes for more than half a century. 
Conceptualizing extractivism as a cosmology provides a crucial framework for understanding how the island, the mine, and the desert gardens are woven together through capitalist colonial logics of land use, mining, waste, pollution, and settler colonialism. But this lens of cosmology also provides a useful framework for helping us to understand how anti-colonial practices of resilience and repair can resist and reframe these same extractivist worldviews. Thank you. Um, so I think I see it firsthand there in the second row. Um, yeah, it's a question for all the panelists. Um, how do you process the affect of your research alongside the production of knowledge? Maybe there's more a question for Crystal and um, Freud. Um, I, I imagine you're producing knowledge. So how uh, do you um, uh, process, what did I write? Um, how do you process the affect? So while you're producing knowledge, is there any affect that comes up for you? Eco grief, for example, um, that may come up for you. Trauma that might come up for you um, doing the kinds of research that you're engaged with. Um, so it's like um, you, you, no one would question that you're producing knowledge, but um, if you could share maybe a bit about the process that is not always made explicit or transparent. Yeah. This actually opens it up to everybody on the panel, I think, yeah. I think, oh, I don't know. Um, I think grief, is <laughs> eco-grief, as you called it, is such an applicable term. Um, I encountered, obviously, a lot of um, work about phosphate mines and so forth in doing my dissertation, which pertains mainly to infrastructure and, and, um, and architecture. But, um, but I think, you know, the, the consequences of these mines are, are very palpable um, if you're traveling throughout Tunisia today. Um, I was there last May and I think still the consequences of the revolution in 2010, 2011 um, are very much alive and very much directly related to the minds themselves. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I completely agree with what you say. I think eco-grief is a, an excellent term. I, I, I resisted using the term eco-grief because it's an abstract term. Mm -hmm. So um, if you could respond at a personal, at a more, if you could respond at a more personal level, because I feel that these abstract terms keep mm -hmm. our affect at a distance. Sure. And I feel that uh, voicing our personal uh, processes um, can allow and give permission for more people to embrace what's actually happening mm. on our planet rather than using language that cloaks what is Absolutely. happening. Yeah. Yes. Hello, hello. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure if this is somehow answering, but thanks for the clarification. Um, I think that the first speaker this morning who had this quote, uh, like, and I forget the first part, but it was essentially how do how do we stop ourselves from dissociating? And I feel I feel like uh, for us we often discuss uh, feeling this increasingly dissociated because that's a kind of. A, uh, what's the word in English? Um, defense mechanism. And so, how to how to reassociate? No, and that's something for us that we discuss. 
I think just also to say that um, there are different levels of um, kind of personal investment in different kinds of work, and I think that that it's also important to, to kind of make space for you know um, somebody doing kind of much more kind of maybe non-effective work versus people who have kind of histories and personal traumas related to that work. So, and I think the over the next two days we'll hear of, of very different kinds of work as well, and um, and engage with them as they are. Oh, but thank you so much for the question. Uh, the, yeah, uh, Alon. Hi, thank Danielle. you. Um, I have a question which like, we struggle a lot with also in our work, like ethical dilemma, and maybe it's a question also for the next two days. Um, but uh, for me, one of the challenges we often encounter is how the depiction of extractivism doesn't become itself extractive. No. I don't have the answer, but it's uh, something that is ongoing, perhaps. Maybe another one. Hello. <laughs> so it is it is very difficult to escape from that from that question, and I think it's nice that we may see with the trouble of of that. But it's also like quite relevant that sometimes. Uh, we need to remember that this, these processes, these histories, these memories, there's an ongoing effort to uh, erase them, to forget them. So sometimes we see in, into this dilemma of, of the need to create a kind of reference point so they don't just disappear. You know, in the case, for instance, in the French colonial archive that have been reclassified, and uh, for instance, any work on, on nuclear uh, testing in, in Algeria is no longer possible. So we have to sit within, sometimes within that tension, you know, between, you know, like, um, um, you know, the, the need to, uh, the need to, uh, they want to forget, remember, you know. So perhaps that does not address precisely your question, but it's perhaps at where we are at the moment, you know. I'm not sure if you will agree entirely with me. Maybe if someone else wants to. I think I, is, is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I think, and this is something that I reflect upon a lot personally, especially in relation to this. And I, some, for example, something I, I, I really am trying to make connections between different, I suppose, I'm, I'm working currently on a big project about the global fertilizer industry more generally. So I'm looking also at nitrogen and uh, potassium, potassium, yeah, as well as uh, phosphorus and phosphates. And um, so it's really, for me, it's, I'm trying to connect different sites, different histories, uh, different layers, different stories, some of which are connected to kind of settler colonial things, which is obviously like quite complicated and um, a compl horrible word. But um, one of the things I'm particularly conscientious of I really it really like makes my teeth like great when people say things like oh I'm um drawing attention to raising awareness of or providing a voice for like people have their own voices like I I was really explicit to mention that there are already a lot of um people specifically in western Sahara and in the, the refugee camps in Algeria who are doing this work who have been doing this work for a very long time and so I never say that I'm speaking for or even raising awareness of. I see it as trying to work collectively with people as much as possible, as much as that um, makes sense in any specific uh, events and contexts and like exhibitions or books or whatever. I also think, I'm, I just was presenting images there as well and I, th I think really what you were saying about like images as being extracted um, practices is something to be um, to be really attentive to and so for me text is like a really important part of that as well and in this project is being specifically presented as a, a book project so texts and bringing other people and, and other voices into those um, projects as well is a really important part of my practice and, and how I work so I, those are just a couple of the strategies that I try to, to use in my work. Thanks. We have some questions online, and I think they have to be maybe the the last maximum two questions. Thanks. Okay, this online question is from Jani for Toba. Um, can you comment on Shell's corporate sponsorships with art institutions like the National Gallery, which have now come to an end after pressure from artists and activists? 
this moment it's kind of works. It's a little in and out. Okay. Okay. okay, we can try. Okay. Just one more? Yeah, we'll try. Um, thank you, and I, I, I think it's really important, and also just in thinking through the last question about thinking through how images over time have changed in their imbrication with a kind of knowledge system like the one that Shell has produced through the arts over a period of decades. So I, well, part of what I'm trying to do in my project is see that arc as a changing one, and it's hard to put a pin in saying, okay, this is a moment where petroleum is trying to gain power through a cultural industry, and then if we address that, uh, then that power will go away. And I think the recent activism around patronage has been really important because that is, I use the word insidious, and I think it is an insidious version of cultural power in the sense that a logo on the wall is very different from an image on the wall or a painting on the wall, like the ones that I was showing that are very explicit about being about petroleum. So I see the activism of these groups, and especially um, in terms of the National Gallery or the images of the Liberate Tape performances, which I put up, which I'll just also say briefly, are, I think, really important because Liberate Tape actually brought proxies for petroleum literally into the galleries. They were using a combination of molasses and other materials, but I think that the idea of pouring a viscous substance, and this is also why I bring William Green in, is actually using petroleum. I think pouring that substance inside the Tate was a really important mode of resistance by making everybody remember the connection between the logo and an actual material. So I, I think that these are lots of different examples of what I think is a long-standing um, long project. And I, I mean... I am curious to see in the future where this, this, the next step of that idea of culture as being part of petroleum is going to go, because I think that all of this really amazing pushback has been so generative and important, but I don't necessarily see that this being the, the last horizon of petroleum companies being involved. So um, I think it's something that we all should learn a history of so that we're um, then seeing, seeing into that future. So thank you for the question. It's um, really great. Um, I'm very aware of time because we're we're running a little bit late, and I can I imagine everyone's hungry as well. So I, I think you know we want to continue conversations over lunch, over coffees, etc. So we'll wrap up now and come back at two thirty, um, so we can start by two thirty-five if everyone's in here. Thank you. Thank you.